Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to be summarizing some of the essential elements of signals and systems. These are the topics that I think is absolutely vital for a student to know when studying for an exam or for someone working in signals analysis. This is part two of a two-part video series. So if you haven't seen part one, you'll find the link in the description below. Of course, more videos which explain all these concepts in more details can be found on my website, iancollings.com. There's a full categorized listing on that website. And subscribe to the channel for more videos. Uh, it really helps the channel. You can also follow me on Instagram and Facebook where I'm on a quest to find signals in everyday life. But for now, let's crack on with part two. Let's look at the essentials of sampling. And here we've got a generic time domain function. And this one is a smooth function. So in the frequency domain, it is going to occupy the low frequency band. So let me draw in a generic function here, which goes between zero frequency and some maximum frequency. We call it FM, the maximum frequency. Now, what happens when we sample this? Well, it's essential to know that when you sample with a period of capital T, so when you have capital T between the samples, then in the frequency domain, you get your original wave uh, representation, but you get copies of this appearing at the sampling frequency. So here is one divided by T. So we're going to get copies at one on T, negative one on T, and multiples of that, two on T and so on. So we'll put these dots here. So that's an essential thing to know about sampling. Now this tells us directly about the most important result of sampling, which is Nyquist sampling rate. So if you wanted to take these samples and then go back and regenerate the original signal, you could only do that exactly if you could go in the frequency domain from this representation with the copies back to the one that has no copies. You would do this by multiplying in the frequency domain by a square function, which is the same as applying a low pass filter in convolution in the time domain. Uh, and you can only do that and recover this if there's no overlap. So here, one divided by T needs to be at least twice FM. You can see that directly here. So one divided by T needs to be at least twice the maximum frequency component in your waveform. So that's Nyquist sampling rate, one of the most fundamental essential elements of signals and systems. And we'll just make one observation here, and that is that We've plotted this with respect to F, but if we plot it with respect to radial frequency, then we get exactly the same, except that the values are, of course, in radians. So we'll do that because of what we're about to look at, which is in discrete time where radians are more appropriate, the more appropriate measure. So here we remember that omega equals two pi f, another essential element of signals and systems to remember. So therefore this copy here appears at two pi divided by t and minus two pi divided by t. Okay, so it's essential to know the difference between the frequency in hertz and radial frequency. Okay, now let's think about signals in discrete time. This was continuous time sampling, but what we can do is take the values of those samples and store them in a computer. When we do that, the time period becomes a discrete time index, which we say little n. And these are just integers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So we are not anymore having a continuous time function with zero between here sampled at this rate, always on a computer you are storing them, they are just indexed by integers. And so what does that do in the frequency domain? Well, it's still the same signal. You're still representing the same signal. So in the frequency domain, you will still have the same shape. And that's an essential thing to know about. The difference is now that the frequency is scaled. So we call this the continuous time frequencies and we call this the discrete time frequencies. And of course the scaling is according to what you can see here can be thought of as this is a sampling with a rate of capital T equals one. So the copies here, you can see up here if capital T equals one, the copies are gonna be at two pi and minus two pi. So in discrete time, 
you have vector, uh, delta functions with no arrows on the top. They are well-defined functions that have exactly the value of the height, uh, but they are at integer on the index. And the copies appear at 2 pi, an essential thing. All discrete time signals have copies at 2 pi. That's another essential property to know about. Okay, what, what if we sample a discrete time signal? So we had sampling continuous time here. What if we sample this discrete time? And let's say, for example, here, we are sampling with a, a period of n equals 2. So what we've done here is we've taken every one of our, uh, every second one of our discrete time samples and we've set them to equal zero. We've only keeping, in this case, we're only keeping the even numbered samples. So what does that do in the frequency domain? Well, it's exactly the same as what happened for continuous time sampling. You will get extra copies and those extra copies will appear at the sampling frequency. So now uh, when we have this, this is our original function now because this is our original discrete time function. We will now be getting copies at that sampling period. So what is that? Well, it is, uh, we're doing omega here. So we've got two pi divided by n is where the copies will be. And n equals two in this case. So two pi on n equals pi. So we're now gonna be getting copies at pi. So we've got the original one, the original, uh, representation, but because we've sampled, we're now getting copies, in this case, at pi and negative pi. Okay, and so now the same property occurs as we had for Nyquist sampling in continuous time. We now need to make sure if we want to reverse this and only store these sampled versions for compression, and but be able to fully recover the original signal, then we need to make sure that when we do this sampling, we don't have any overlap here. And so we still have the two pi on n needs to be bigger than twice the uh, maximum of the discrete time frequency here, where this is omega maximum for our signal. So for example, if we had n equals three, there would be, uh, would be, there would be copies would be appearing at two pi on three. So then we would have two pi on three, four pi on three. The next one would of course be two pi, that's uh, six pi on three. And so then we'd have two copies in between and they may or may not overlap depending on the width of our original signal. So these are some of the essential things to know about sampling and the essential things to know about discrete time. So there are two other functions that are absolutely critical in signals and systems, and they are the Laplace transform and the Z transform. And the Laplace transform is for continuous time, and the Z transform is for discrete time. Now, what is the Laplace transform? Well, if we see it in terms of the Fourier transform, it can be viewed as a generalization of the Fourier transform. So in continuous time, we use this notation for the Fourier transform and the generalization gives us this notation with a new parameter S. And S equals sigma plus J omega, where J is the square root of minus one. Sometimes used I, mathematicians use I, Electrical engineers use J because they use I for the current. Okay, so it's a generalization of the Fourier transform. That's the first essential thing to know about the Laplace transform. Um, in the Z transform, it is likewise a generalization of the Fourier transform for discrete time. So this is how we represent the Fourier transform for discrete time, and this goes to X of Z, where in discrete time we do polar coordinates. So in continuous time for the Laplace transform, we use Cartesian. For the uh, discrete time for the Z transform, Z equals R e to the J omega. And so this is uh, essential to know the difference here, Cartesian and polar for Laplace and Z. So what is this generalization? What's the essential thing to know? Well, this sigma here is a parameter which enables the Fourier transform to be calculated for functions where it wouldn't otherwise be able to be calculated. And that leads us to the concept of a region of convergence. And certain values of sigma will allow that integral to be calculated and others won't. We call those values that allow it the region of convergence. 
So if we plot the S plane where we have sigma and omega, so this is this Cartesian plane of S, then you get things called poles and the region of convergence is a region of the S plane where you have the integral be able to be calculated. So what do we, what are some of the essential things? Well, a pole is a boundary of a region of convergence. It's essential to know that. Regions of convergence go between poles or from pole to infinity or negative infinity. So it's important to know that. And the region of convergence depends only on the sigma, not on the omega. So it's a vertical line boundary for the Laplace transform. Uh, another uh, essential thing is that regions of convergence for Laplace, if they are right-handed regions of convergence, then they correspond to right-handed time domain functions. All systems which are causal have a right-handed region of convergence. That's an important property to know about. Uh, another property to know about is, of course, in this plane here, when sigma equals zero, you are left with j omega and you simply have the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform, where is that on here? Sigma equals zero is this axis here. So on this axis is where the Fourier transform lives. So a consequence of that is if the region of convergence includes that axis, then the Fourier transform can be calculated. And if the Fourier transform can be calculated, then if we're talking about a linear time invariant system, then the linear time invariant system is stable. So that's another important property. If the j omega axis is inside the region of convergence, the system is stable. Okay, so what? how do these translate for discrete time for the z transform? Well, you just got to translate those properties into polar. So if we plot the axis here with the real part of z and the imaginary part of z, then we're going to be getting values of R that is playing the same role as the sigma. Again, it's about convergence of a summation. In this case, it's a summation because it's discrete time and you're summing uh, infinite series. So you'll get values of R if there's a pole here. You, this will create now a circle because R is a magnitude in the polar uh, coordinates. And so again, you'll have regions of where the integral or the summation, sorry, will converge and regions where they won't. And if I shade this region here as a region of convergence, we know that this one corresponds to a causal system because uh, this was right-handed here, corresponds in Z to an external region. So if it's outside a circle then it, it and it goes to infinity, then it is a causal system. So that property carries over that way. Uh, in this uh, polar coordinates, where is the Fourier transform? Well, clearly the Fourier transform is when Z equals E to the J omega, that is when R equals one. So here there'll be a value of one. Uh, if I plot that, there'll be a circle at one and it is on that circle that the Fourier transform exists. As you increase around the, uh, around the circle in this way, this is omega uh, increasing as you go around the circle. Uh, and so, if again, if the region of convergence includes the unit circle, then the Fourier transform can be calculated, then the system is stable. So the things uh, that we know from Laplace carry over for discrete time with the Z transform. Uh, it's just that instead of Cartesian, we're now doing polar coordinates. So these videos, part one and part two, have summarized the main essential elements of signals and systems. If you found them to be useful, uh, like the video, it helps others to find it. Of course, subscribe to the channel for more videos, helps the channel out. And you can check out the description below. You'll find a link to a web page which contains a full categorized listing of all the videos on the channel.